Good afternoon to everyone, and it's a privilege to be here. And I want to thank the People's Tribunal in particular for the opportunity to address you and to address these critically important questions. So I co-chair the International Dispute Resolution and Public International Law Groups of the international law firm of Dubbo Boys and Plimpton. I've worked in the field of public international law for over 20 years with a particular focus in my human rights practice on the protection of media freedoms. And in 2021, I was appointed the deputy chair of the international expert body, the high level panel of legal experts on media freedom. Would you please describe um, your work at the high level panel? Perhaps not only your work individually, but the mandate and what the high level panel up of today. And I know there's been um, some growth in, in, in extensions in the mandate, but just what they're doing and what they're aiming at doing, please. Of course, happy to. So the panel is the independent advisory body of the Media Freedom Coalition, which is a coalition of 52 countries that have pledged collectively and individually to fight against restrictive laws, punitive legal measures, physical violence, and other challenges that far too many journalists face today. To quote the founding document of the Media Freedom Coalition, the member countries recognize that, and again, I quote, media freedom is an integral element of global security and prosperity. And people need free media to provide them with accurate information and informed analysis and governments are to be held to account. And I'll end the quote there. The core of the mission is protection of free media as a central pillar of democracy. The panel itself was founded in 2019. It was founded at the request of the UK and Canadian governments and is comprised of 15 leading experts in international law. The mandate is to provide specific legal advice and recommendations to member countries of the coalition on ways that they can promote and protect a vibrant, free and independent media. The panel's chair is Lord Newberger, the former president of the UK Supreme Court, and I serve as deputy chair of that panel to help advance this critical work. And as I think we've heard throughout the course of the day, the work has never been more urgent. 2021 marked the 15th consecutive year of decline in global freedom, according to Freedom House. And it's a crisis that's global in nature with hundreds of journalists targeted and killed worldwide. In terms of its work, the panel and its members have in various forms produced advisory reports on key media freedom issues, addressed concrete recommendations to individual and collective coalition countries, provided individual countries with legal advice in the form of legal opinions on draft legislation when media freedoms are engaged and issued amici curiae opinions at the request of international and regional courts in landmark media freedom cases. In addition, in the first couple of years of the panel's um, constitution, we produced four advisory reports that recommend a number of actions that we say countries can and should take to improve the protection afforded to media freedoms. And they're in four key areas. I'll be quite brief, but I just wanted to mention those four areas because I think at the core of this, they are implicated by, by the questions and the facts that we've been discussing. So the first is the establishment of a system of emergency visas for journalists at risk of arbitrary arrest or targeting or violence in their home countries. The second is the development of a robust system of consular support for journalists facing such persecution. The third is the use of targeted travel and financial sanctions specifically against individuals for abuses against journalists. And finally, and quite centrally um, the topic of focus today, the building of capacity to properly investigate abuses to engage greater accountability, including, and we can speak to it further, the creation of what we've called for as an independent investigative task force. And I must say that in the years that have come since the issuance of these reports, accountability has been a key focus of the panel's work. We've prioritized specifically asking states to develop and promote capacity for accountability, given how important that is, not just for the abuses that have occurred, but in disincentivizing and protecting against abuses that would could occur 
and the targeting of rule of law and media organizations. If you allow me, um, before we go into the specific case of Mr. Lasanta, uh, in touching on, on the recommendations that you just mentioned, uh, what is, well, not only what recommendations specifically, but what is the high level panel um, underst understanding or, or opinion on the state of impunity, part of this tribunal or the focus of this tribunal in these three cases, but frankly around the world is not only analyze what we know is there, and it's a fact, the violence against uh, these professionals and freedom of expression, but also the inability to effectively investigate uh, in their home, in the countries where these events take place, but even beyond, effectively, the, what, what is in, in your, as a member naturally of the high level panel, your opinion, and perhaps recommendations or ideas the high-level panel is, is entertaining us to be more effective? Absolutely, and it's an excellent question. One of the key areas of work identified by the high-level panel from the very outset was accountability. And in fact, the, the, the fourth area that I mentioned, which is the, invest, the accountability and building capacity to investigate abuses has been the core for focus of multiple recommendations and those recommendations, we, just, we wanted to, one, be clear-eyed about the challenges, the current challenges that governments face in achieving accountability when it comes to the targeting and abuse of journalists as an evidentiary matter, as a domestic prosecutions matter. But second, thinking about international or transnational efforts that could allow journalists who are currently under siege in governments where domestic accountability is frankly a dream, not realistic, to be able to access international mechanisms for accountability. So what, what, in that fourth enforcement report, which focuses on effective investigations, we are addressing with individual countries, we're addressing with the co-chairs and the executive group of Media Freedom Coalition, how to bolster domestic accountability regimes in the sense of transparency and reporting out of investigations where there are allegations of of abuse and harassment or even murder of journalists and enhancing the transparency around those facts. And where domestic accountability through court action, through domestic investigations is simply too unrealistic, futile, would not actually get us to justice, accessing regional and international means more easily. Right now there's a huge hurdle and challenge for individual journalists, for organizations to be able to access those international mechanisms. And part of the concrete recommendations of the panel in that effective investigation report is to think about international and regional bodies that can make that more accessible as a mechanism to access justice. Wonderful. Um, in specifically, perhaps we should just go into uh, La Santa case. Would you mind relating, I know you were deeply involved, relating uh, how you came about working that, in that case and investigation? Sure. So we, we serve as co-counsel with the Center for Justice and Accountability, including Mushin uh, Sarkarati, who you heard from this morning, in representing Ahimsa Vikramatunga in seeking justice for the murder of her father, La Santa. And it's been some uh, work that we've undertaken for the last several years, including representing Ahimsa in a civil case before U.S. courts, where we sought remedies on, on uh, behalf of charges relating to extrajudicial killing, crimes against humanity, and torture. Well, I understand that Ms. Sarkarati will discuss that case in greater detail tomorrow. I did want to mention that we're also representing Ahimsa, and this goes to looking for mechanisms of accountability above and beyond domestic mechanisms, but representing Ahimsa in a complaint before the Human Rights Committee, alleging that by assassinating La Santa and failing to investigate his murder, Sri Lanka has violated the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And I'm happy to, to get further into that. We, we took this case on as part of a, a broader human rights practice in which we serve as counsel to individual journalists specifically, and this goes back to the accountability point, specifically where Accessibility of domestic mechanisms are simply just insurmountable. The challenges are insurmountable. So from our perspective, it's very important to be able to reach out to individual journalists who are under stress, under duress, who have been targeted for harassment and abuse, 
and match them up with legal mechanisms that are more international and regional in nature. And as we, we've all heard, La Santa was assassinated, frankly, in retaliation for his reporting on the allegations of corruptions made against Rajapaksa, who then was Sri Lanka's Secretary of Defense. And I can think of no higher goal of journalism than to investigate public leaders for violations of the public trust. And his murder, I think, exemplifies the need to hold governments to account for their role in perpetrating violence against journalists. And it's what we've called a culture of impunity that protects the killers, that is unacceptable, not just for the individuals and their families involved, for Los Santa and his family, but for the continued safety of journalists in Sri Lanka, around the world, and for protection of the rule of law. From you, you talk about culture of impunity, and I think it also allows me to to amplify a little bit the question, if I may. From your experience in human rights, you said that they, with a special focus, um, given the conditions on journalists and freedom of expression, what are the elements if you could share in the Los Angeles case that made it uh, well, made made it of of, uh, of interest in the sense of seeking accountability beyond Sri Lanka? And in the persistence, perhaps, of impunity, what you call, I believe, culture of impunity, if you could relate it around this, the La Santa case, but also in relation to other cases that you could put um, in comparison with this one. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of the culture of impunity, I think what I'm referring to is the political context in which La Santa and others are operating. So as we've heard, Sri Lanka has a long and well-documented history of failing to hold perpetrators of human rights violations accountable for crimes, especially when those allegations involve government officials. And most recently, the Human Rights Council adopted a re resolution, this was last year, that expressly stated serious concern about ongoing impunity, political obstruction for accountability of human rights violations in Sri Lanka, and urging the government to live up to its obligations under international and domestic law. And I think La Santa's murder tragically puts center stage and speaks to Sri Lanka's ongoing legacy of impunity. His murder, as you suggested, was just one of a series of attacks against journalists in Sri Lanka since the start of the country's civil war. They've been part of a concerted plan to prevent investigations into war crimes, crimes against humanity, as well as any element of that history of violence. And sensitive to the, any criticism of the war effort, allegations of corruption, the Rajapaksa regime has invoked new national security laws to attack the free press, including routine assaults, arrests, and deportation of journalists. In September 2015, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights dedicated investigation on Sri Lanka, and that concluded that the Rajapaksa regime appeared, quote, systematic in their repeated targeting of specific media known for being critical of government policies or figures, end quote. So understandably, many journalists in Sri Lanka have fled, many have self-centered, and international press bureaus and independent media outlets have been downsized or closed. And this is something that's part and parcel to a global phenomena that, that we're witnessing, which is part of the reason why the work of the panel in advising the Media Freedom Coalition is looking for systemic global solutions. But I have to say there, there are limits to what we can accomplish through legal mechanisms because it does require political will. And La Santa's case, again, just to go back to your question, really exemplifies why we need a combination of both. So La Santa was, even after he started getting harassed and persecuted, he was among the, the brave journalists who decided to stay, who decided to stay for love of their country, who decided to stay because the importance of making facts known to everyone to support freedoms was so important to him that he was willing to risk his life. And I think as we've heard, he founded the Sunday Leader in 94. He continued to run an independent newsroom until his murder in 2009. And I, I trust that the tribunal will hear about the remarkable work that he undertook in those 15 years in the face of such unimaginable pressure. He was killed while he was driving to work 
on 8 January 2009. Three days after he was killed, the Sunday Leader published a posthumous editorial that he left on file in the event of his death. And Ms. Sakurada drew your attention to this letter earlier today, and it goes without saying that it perfectly captures why accountability for his murder is so important. And again, this is not just about Lasanta, but tragically, the pattern of attacks against journalists continued after his murder. Government security forces attacked at least seven other journalists in the remaining years of the Rajapaksa administration, including at least three assaults, two death threats, one disappearance, one shooting, and one deportation. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask you perhaps um, just detouring a little bit, but uh, to wear perhaps two hats at the same time, if you may, as you answer. One as a, naturally a lawyer who has investigated these cases and who actually went as far as bringing an effort of accountability in conjunction with the Center for Justice and Accountability in the United States, which is pretty far from Sri Lanka, and another perhaps a double hat of being a high-level panel in the efforts that the high-level panel are trying to, uh, is trying to achieve. And what do you think of uh, present time of the impact of these uh, mechanisms or these efforts, just to be more comprehensive. And if I may not to trap you, but what will it be the ideal or expected impact in, to, to achieve as we hopefully move towards more effective steps uh, on accountability? Thank you for the question. I think first and foremost, it's transparency. It's making sure the world appreciates and knows what happened and what happened to La Santa is happening now today, this very minute in Sri Lanka, in other countries, and why it's important for those of us who are devoted to the protection of the rule of law, for countries to acknowledge that we are in crisis, that the independence of the media is part and parcel to a free society that we all endeavor to and that we are in currently in crisis. So the first is to talk about it to, through the efforts of the People's Tribunal, through the commitment of the 52 countries and the Media Freedom Coalition to shed light on what is going on so that these actions, these extrajudicial killings, the harassment, the abuse does not use the cover of night to escape accountability. So that's first is transparency. And second, to think broadly about regional and international mechanisms, because it is so difficult, if not impossible, in certain circumstances, including in Sri Lanka, to achieve domestic accountability. That's just a dream in Sri Lanka. I mean, I, I wanna say for a minute that I didn't have the honor of getting to know Lasanta, but I am sure that his daughter, Himsa, would make him proud. Not only is she a successful journalist in her own right, but she's never stopped fighting for justice for her father's murder. But ultimately, no matter that devotion, no matter the really egregious and documented facts of his targeting and his killing, it was impossible to obtain in Sri Lanka accountability and justice. Rajapaksa himself set the tone for the government's response. In a 2009 interview that's still up on YouTube, he dismissed Lasanta's killing as, and I quote, just another murder, end quote. And he asked the BBC journalist rhetorically why he was, quote, so worried about one man, end quote. And as, as will be detailed, I believe tomorrow, the government has thwarted every effort to investigate his murder since, doctoring medical records, intimidating witnesses, replacing honest investigators, and making evidence disappear. This is a playbook. It's not a single circumstance, but it goes to show why domestic accountability is so difficult. So from the perspective of the panel's work and these international mechanisms, the Focus Media Freedom Coalition, it is absolutely critical to pursue justice. And as you say, the United States is far afield from Sri Lanka, but we were able to assert facts that made jurisdiction in United States courts for some of these abuses, including his presence in the United States as a basis for the domestic litigation. Equally went before the Human Rights Committee. And again, part of this access to accountability and the mechanisms is to make these facts known so that there can be the hope of justice, even if 
currently in Sri Lanka, it cannot come from Sri Lankan government. And I'll, I'll just note today that there's lots of challenges in domestic courts as well. Uh, the U.S. case actually was dismissed on, on the basis of head of state immunity when Rajapaksa was elected president. And so that case automatically had to be dismissed. But the Human Rights <coughs> Committee complaint continues. So again, another reason why the international mechanisms are so important and another reason why the high level panel working in conjunction with the Media Freedom Coalition is so focused on accountability and effective mechanisms for investigation. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions. So if the panel, perhaps. Thank you, Catherine, for your testimony. It's a f question regarding what you just said. You mentioned that because of the situation at the domestic jurisdiction, and I'm quoting you, it's important to go to regional or international mechanisms. I know international mechanisms for Sri Lanka, but what regional mechanisms you were thinking? You're thinking a specific regional mechanism for, for Sri Lanka, and do you know that the case or other cases are ongoing there? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I was referring to uh, regional human rights mechanisms. So the Inter-American Commission, Inter-American Court, African Commission, African Court, uh, where we have seen examples of media freedom challenges that have come up, not in the context of Sri Lanka, but more broadly. Um, so when I was thinking of, when I mentioned regional mechanisms, it's those kinds of human rights bodies where you can manifest, for example, violations of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, you can think about it in the, the context of universal freedoms around liberty and security of the person, freedom from torture, rights of free expression, expression, access to effective remedy. These are all, these kinds of rights are manifest, not just in the universal rights charters and the ICCPR is obviously paramount, but also in the regional charters. So that's what I was referencing in terms of access to justice in those regional mechanisms. May I? Uh, Helen, a follow-up question. I totally agree with you, and I think that the problem in Sri Lanka is much worse because there is no regional mechanisms. You know, uh, Sri Lanka is not under the jurisdiction of the inter-American system or the African system or the European system. And unfortunately, for Southeastern uh, Asia and from other regions of the world, you know, civil society was pushing for having regional mechanisms, but there is not a regional mechanism for Sri Lanka. So if there is no, you know, justice at the domestic level and the UN level is doing some work, and I think you were involved in that, the problem is that we don't have a regional mechanism and other re mechanisms to, to get justice. But it was just for my clarification. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I, I have, this is very interesting, but uh, forgive me, I don't want to sound cynical, but I'm really trying to understand. So the 52 countries who you say are members of the Media Freedom Coalition, are they representatives of the government or are they civil society representatives? Who are they? I couldn't quite understand. And secondly, do you have even one instance of where this kind of international pressure um, on a country, on a state, has actually led to some concrete change in terms of, uh, you know, um, uh, dismantling structures that are um, uh, restricting a free media. Because, you know, I'm, I, I'm a journalist, so I'm trying to put my head around this. So, yeah. you know, we can, we can appeal to international mechanisms, but do they really work? in states, not just Sri Lanka, but you know, many other countries. That's why I want to know if there is one instance. And please just explain to me at least this 52 members who they are. Sure, absolutely. And you don't sound cynical. You ask all the questions we should constantly be asking ourselves about whether something is working. So the Media Freedom Coalition is a coalition of the countries themselves. So it's the governments who have committed to be part of this coalition, who have committed to a mandate and a charter who have committed and put together our body, the high level panel of legal experts to advise them as an independent advisory body. So at the, for example, this year's ministerial was held in Tallinn, Estonia. I had the privilege of 
being there and representing the panel and members, um, high level delegations of the 52, most of the 52 countries, actually it was an extraordinary level of participation, went to Palin, Talon, excuse me, to report out on their progress, on especially their progress with respect to the various, the four subject matter areas in which I've, I've mentioned that we have concrete recommendations by the panel itself. And so Talon was an opportunity to take stock that is a direct participatory framework for the countries themselves to come to the table and say, this is a priority, we are in crisis, this is what we're willing to do, and it's the combination of the political will and the legal means that I mentioned that's so important. You have to join the two. So the UK and Canada were the initial, initial co-chairs, it's now the UK and the Netherlands. And I will say, and this included in Tallinn, each state reported out on its progress to date. And there is plenty of reason to keep pushing, to your point, is this actually effective? Are states doing things? There's plenty of reason to keep pushing because I think the states themselves, including because of the pandemic and various things that have slowed down efforts across the board and diplomatic efforts across the board, aren't doing enough currently. But we also saw where we got traction on some of the concrete recommendations. So this goes to the second part of your question. Is it making a difference? So for example, Canada was one of the first countries to commit to a very specific emergency visa that journalists could take advantage of when they are in danger in their home countries. That was a marvelous and very concrete first step. And we were very happy to see, while we don't have yet a critical mass of countries who are willing to, to make this political commitment, we do have pending legislation in the Netherlands. We do have the ability to see in the statements of other countries that this is getting traction. That's just one example. The other place that where I think that we're seeing some concerted efforts is around legislation, or let me put it this way, the misuse of, for example, criminal defamation um, statutes. As I mentioned, part of what the panel does is to give advice on draft legislation or legislation that's currently in force um, that, is, uh, that is being misused to target journalists. So we see that in two areas. One is criminal defamation, the other is, is terrorism and anti-terrorism statutes. La, La Santa's case, exemplifies why misuse of anti-terrorism statutes is so effectively used against and to on attacks of media. But on the criminal defamation, for example, that's also used to go after media, um, members of the media for the content of their speech. And it's used by governments across the world. There, I can say in the Inter-American Court, the panel was able to put in an amicus curiae brief that explained why the misapplication and misuse of criminal defamation was so dangerous to media freedom uh, and to independent voices uh, across the board and frankly, the rule of law to good effect. So I would say, I don't think that you're being cynical. I think countries should be put on, on notice that they need to take concrete actions. We are way past the time of just words and that they will be measured by those concrete actions. And on, in Estonia, that was the tone of, of what it meant to be part of the Media Freedom Coalition. They actually had to show concrete actions. The only other thing I'll say is that part of the panel's remit is to engage in bilaterals with each and every member, each and every of the 52 members. It's going to take us a while to get through all 52, but we're starting with the executive group in which we ask for exactly what you're suggesting. What have you done here? What have you done here? What more can you be doing here? So I, again, I, I really appreciate the question. I think we should be cynical until we see results, but there is very good reason to push and the Media Freedom Coalition is important in the sense that these 52 countries have committed to prioritizing this question and these issues. So just, just a small follow-up. So uh, yeah. I, I'm presuming that the three countries that we, have, we are addressing, Syria, Sri Lanka, um, and Mexico are not part of this coalition, am I right? Or is any one of them part of it? Um, Mexico, I believe, is Mexico part of it. And, uh, okay. yeah. the, the other two are not. And the one point I should mention is when, you, when we talk about the effects of the Media Freedom Coalition, there's obviously the direct participation of member states, but the 52 states. I cannot say enough, though, about the domino effect of these 52 states serving as a paradigm 
of the political will and the legal mechanisms to actually address these issues effectively. So for example, if we set up what we've asked for, which is a international accountability mechanism to assure invested and effective investigations, it's like the mechanism for the Syria conflict where the purpose of it is internationally to be a repository of competent evidence. And you can imagine how useful that would have been in Lasanta's case for accountability, both domestic and internationally. So it is about also serving as an example to states that are not part of the coalition. Marina, yes. Yes, um, th thank you. Uh, it's just a follow-up question of, on the follow-up question of my colleague. Um, you said, for instance, Mexico is part of the coalition. In the case of Mexico or in any other case, when, uh, one country who's, who is a member of the coalition, so who, who uh, uh, is supposed to um, be uh, committed to protect the freedom of the media, etc. In the case of a country, do not comply or is uh, is problematic. Do the coalition has um, ever? Uh, took actions, I, I, I imagine there are no enforcing action, but action like recommendation or raising the alarm somehow? Yes, and, and that's through, um, as you anticipate, it's, it's largely through the good work of the co-chairs and the member states, which are in the executive group, where they use their bilateral and multilateral mechanisms in order to leverage compliance. And by the way, I should mention that it's not automatic that membership in the Media Freedom Coalition continues. If there are certain countries that are recalcitrant or not delivering or kind of violating the basic norms of the Media Freedom Coalition, it stands to reason that they would fall out of the coalition themselves. So the mechanisms of enforcement are largely diplomatic, but it's also the benefits of being members of the Media Freedom Coalition. And I should just take this moment to, to correct myself on Mexico. Mexico is not a part of the Media Freedom Coalition. My apologies for that. I just double checked and it's not a part. Thank you. And uh, sorry, has it ever happened that the country was uh, left out or was invited not to be part anymore of the coalition? Not yet, but as these things go, it's a fairly young coalition. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think it largely depends on the direction that the co-chairs, uh, the Netherlands and Canada, choose to take it. So I can't really say where it's going, but I do know that those co-chairs are very committed to seeing action, not just words from these member states. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did you me do you mention these... Uh like um, recommendations and is, if I am clear, the system of emergency visas for risks, no? Counseling support that is like psychological or what is that? I don't know, <laughs> or legal. And the others target travel and money of people and build capacity to investigate. And I will, yes, I would like to know more about how, yes, uh, how do you think this will work or this will be implemented uh, in the countries and how this can help to save lives and to and to allow journalists to do their work? Yes, um, thank you for the, the question. I'll just clarify one thing. So it's not counselor services, but consular services. So it's consistent with um, the Vienna Convention on um, Consular Assistance, where consulates sitting in different countries should be there to support their nationals. That includes in get, obtaining lawyers if they've been subject to arrest without uh, counsel and other support services for nationals of their consulates. So that, that's the consular services piece. But going back to your broader question, with respect to these four areas, these reports, these four reports, um, and they're on the Media Freedom Coalition website, and I encourage everyone to take a look, but they run across hundreds of pages 
of documenting why when it comes to emergency visas, when it comes to consular services, the current use of sanctions and investigative support, why there are systematic challenges that taken together and individually have resulted in impunity and lack of accountability when media workers are targeted. So these hundreds of pages of analysis are accompanied by very concrete recommendations in each of those four areas. And when I say that the high level panels work currently is focused on enforcement, it's literally reading, going through the list of the concrete recommendations in each of these four areas and engaging countries bilaterally and in multilateral regional groups as appropriate to, to say, have you done this? Have you done that? And one really easy concrete example is that we ask countries to just commit to 50, 50 emergency visas to save the lives of lawyers, excuse me, of, of reporters when they're in danger. Can you commit to 50? That is actually a very, it's a difficult political ask to ask for emergency visas, but we made it and we have more and more countries, three um, so far and more coming that are committed to specific emergency visas or using programs like the United States humanitarian parole programs specifically to address the risk of harm to journalists. So the good news is I think that states, these countries in the coalition and even outside the coalition are taking steps in these four areas as a priority. And we identified these are the four areas that we need to focus on. I haven't mentioned in the second phase of work, we are focused on the cyber targeting of journalists. I think that's going beyond the scope of today, but the use of cyber tools like Pegasus to infiltrate the phones of journalists to target them is an egregious, egregious abuse of power. And unfortunately it's happening more and more and more uh, these days. So we're also focused on cyber um, targeting of journalists. The short of it is, I think that there's political will. There's certainly dozens of recommendations the panel has put forward and there's a current engagement process. And I think that progress is being made, not at the rate that I would want it to be made, but progress is being made in these, in these areas. Um. Another, I want to know more about this capacity, building capacity to investigate. Like, uh, I don't know if in these recommendations you have like really, really specific how a crime of a journalist has to be investigated, have to be investigated. And about the other thing that you mentioned of emergency visas. I don't know, the countries that are helping journalists and give visa, they help journalists to continue uh, working as journalists in the new country, uh, to continue investigating what they were investigating in the countries that they have to leave. Yes, thank you. I'll take the second question first. The, the short answer is yes. The idea of these emergency visas is not just to get them and frankly their family members because you can target a journalist not just by targeting them directly, but targeting their family as a means of coercion. So the idea is to get them out of the um, dangerous circumstances that they are in, in order not just to save their lives, but to facilitate their work going forward. A lot of these journalists, as we have heard, are brave beyond belief. And what they need is help to continue their work. And so that is a big focus on the safe refuge and the visa recommendations. On the um, investigative uh, aspect of it, so there, there are several concrete recommendations that, that we have. I think in the time that we have, the one I'll focus on is the multilateral investigative task force. This was frankly modeled very much like the mechanism for Syria and, and preserving evidence, but the idea being to bring international best practice in terms of effective evidence preservation, effective investigative approaches, and concretely how to establish and overcome the political and logistical obstacles that it takes to be able to, to, have a, to launch a case of this, of this magnitude. Just to give you a sense for Lasanta's um, case, to bring that case into US courts, to bring it before the Human Rights Committee, took hundreds and hundreds of hours 
of investigative work in order to determine, for example, how we could link La Santa's uh, murder to the government in particular, but also in the brief, the legal briefing and all of the aspects that are so important actually bringing a case to justice. So one of the first steps though is the investigative accountability. By having a neutral body that could be charged with preserving evidence, especially when you have the evidence destruction and witness intimidation measures that I mentioned in Lasanta's case, is critically important to be able to ultimately get accountability outside of the domestic. So that's, I'd say, one of the most important aspects of the effective mechanisms recommendations is to have this multilateral international body that is dedicated to preserving evidence and facilitating accountability through legal means. Uh, I'd like to ask about uh, <clears throat> this multilateral uh, body that you're proposing. Uh, under whose auspices? It would be, we've recommended that um, a number of the media freedom countries agree to undertake multilateral negotiations and agree to the mechanism, a mechanism of this nature. So we um, specifically have baked it into concrete asks of certain members if they would take leadership. All of those discussions are ongoing and I can't say yet whether um, we will get enough states to sign up to it, but it's directed specifically at the Media Freedom Coalition countries. Okay, there are no more questions. Just thank you very much for participating in the People's Tribunal today and, and I think we'll let you go. Thank you very much. It's been a privilege. Thank you, everyone.